So I recently uh, recorded a Warframe episode where I talk like this. I'm, s I'm sitting with my mouth like right next to the microphone, and I'm like, I'm like speaking very like slowly and softly. So I'm doing, <laughs> I'm doing this ASMR thing, people. Now I want you to know that I'm not, ac we're not actually an ASMR channel. We have a baby. We have a baby, and currently the baby is sleeping. So we're trying to not wake up the baby while we're recording the thing. I'm gonna talk like a normal person. Oh, are you? You're not gonna join in the? Uh, no, I hate it. In the asthma cast. No. Also, my <laughs> voice isn't as loud as yours, so I don't think I have to. I, I have a bit of a booming voice. That's mm. true. We've discovered, you know, the the wonders of of audio post processing, where we can make our our uh, voice the same volume on when you're listening to this, even though in reality they are not <laughs> the same volume. No. Also, I don't think she can hear us. If she wakes up, it's just because she wants to. Mm. However, this, However. Is, this is not a podcast where we discuss at what volume we discuss what we discuss. Well, I, I feel like this is a podcast where we discuss whatever we want to. All right. What <laughs> do you want to discuss today? Now, we've been throwing around some different topics for, for discussions and... Uh, one thing, you actually brought it up uh, as a potential topic, even though uh, you said that it's probably more a me thing than a you thing, mm -hmm. uh, which is the topic of endgame content in video games, whether that is something that is needed, whether that is something like games have to have, if 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 you have to cater to people who want endgame content and the like, and... You know what, even at a more basic level, what is endgame content, right? Yeah, what is endgame content to you? Well, like the idea is that basically games are divided up into two games, right? Mm -hmm. So first you have the, the experience of playing maybe the game's story from start to finish in, in the cases where games have a, a start point and a finish point. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you have this this crafted narrative that the developers have made, and then you 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 play the game and you do the thing, and you experience what you were meant to experience. And then, when that's done, you sit there and you ask yourselves, "Then what? Now what? Do I do I just stop playing the game now?" Or should there be something that brings me back and lets me continue to play this game forever and ever? And if so, should developers like keep adding stuff to games? Like that's that's a live service thing because I play a lot of Warframe, right? That is a game that does not have an end. I mean, if we're going at this just from a developer perspective and i say this is someone that works in development not of video games obviously but of something else uh trying not to dox myself here <laughs> <laughs> um but uh really kind of depends on 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 how your game is monetized right if it's just that you buy it once and then people expect you to just keep adding to it that's not really like doable right because it, it always costs you money to develop more content for for the game so with the See, service that's... like warframe where you can buy things in game See, um, that's that's that how makes... you that's how you got to be smart like bungie with the with the destiny game where you have you first have to pay for the base game and then you also have to pay for the updates well, you know my opinion on that <laughs> i think we've discussed this on the podcast before actually where i think that's that's coming right um, so either I pay for, for like a DLC, um, which like, that's kind of my second point, right? So it's either you make a DLC, like you do in things like, you know, Dark Souls games where we're having end game to me doesn't really make sense. Well, the, the, the only two things that there are for end game in, in Souls or Souls-like games are, uh, number one, PVP, yes. right? And number two, it's the... Oh, what are they called in Bloodborne? These these dungeons, the chalice, the dungeons. chalice dungeons, where you can just keep doing that, I suppose. Um, but but it's really adding to the story, right? So story type games, you make more story. Otherwise, but that's, it yeah, but really that's not end game. Sense. It's not it's not end game. It's 
Well, you know, it's something to do once you've completed the game, right? But, well, it's, you, but, but if you just add on more stuff to the game, I wouldn't refer to that as end game content. I wouldn't refer to like Artorias of the Abyss as end game content. It's just more of the game. Well, yes. Th- that's what I'm saying. That's one thing you can do for story driven games. Otherwise, end game doesn't really make sense to me. Well, I'm, I'm still saying game. that that's not end game. That, 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 the, the, okay. the, the concept of end game does not apply to story DLC. It's not the same thing. All right. Well, um, and then otherwise, I mean, it's like Did you Stardew see the... Valley Concerned Ape just <laughs> keeps updating the game. And I'm actually honestly surprised. Maybe he has a Patreon and people pay him for that because otherwise, I mean, he's working on a new game now. But otherwise, I'm just amazed at how much he has been updating and adding things. Yeah, but it's not a free game, right? No, but once you have it, all these updates are free. Well, I would imagine that people are still buying it. Yes, but all of the people that already have it, you know, we just keep getting more and more content and we don't have to pay for it, which is unusual, but appreciated, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like, I mean, other people release that as DLC, like the game is twice as big now, I think. But that's, <laughs> yeah, but that's the thing we talked about with like No Man's Sky and uh, Cyberpunk as well, where they just keep on going back and just keep on working on the game even though it's out and they had their big release and they probably already got most of the money they're going to get from it. Yeah, so I mean, like I said, maybe maybe there is monetization in there that I'm just not aware of because, you know, Stardew fans, we love throwing money his way. We just buy it on every platform. That's and true. How many, times, how many times have you bought Stardew? Let's not talk about it. <laughs> um, but uh, d- 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 that is unusual but appreciated. In in games like RimWorld, they, they keep releasing DLC and that is absolutely, to me, uh, like a reason to play the game more longer again whatever because that's what what you want with end game right it's like people are like oh i like this gameplay loop i want more of it but i don't want to have to start over with the new character i just want to do more with this character or world or whatever that i have now yeah that, that's your definition of end game then well it's one definition of end game uh did you see the the south park episode make love not warcraft no. it's probably one of the most famous south park episodes i've only seen south park episodes practically when you have made me watch oh, them oh but but it's funny <sighs> it is it is you it is i saw you laughing for me. i saw it's you like... laughing Yes, there are things in there that I chuckle at, but a lot of the times I'm like, this is too edgy. Anyway. So, Make Love Not uh, Warcraft is the episode where they play World of Warcraft and they get addicted to World of Warcraft. And they get, like, spawn camped by some no-life basement dweller who just screws them over. And the entire episode is about them becoming strong enough to actually beat him. Mm -hmm. Uh, So they also have to become no-lifing basement dwellers uh to dedicate their entire lives to just playing world of warcraft and nothing else mm-hmm. and finding the sword of a thousand truths or whatever that that they can use to be yeah been yeah. there done that yeah so so then you know the the culmination of the episode is like now they're they're all level 100 and they all weigh 200 pounds and they live in their mother's basement and they got a bunch of pimples and like mountain dew drip hooked up to their arms or whatever and and then it's like okay they're level 100 and they have like all of the best gear in the game they finally beat that guy and then kyle asks like oh now what and carbon is like oh now we can actually start playing the game because you know it's it's the idea being that like there is content that is created for people who who basically have already maxed out everything yeah i mean in in the case of world of warcraft i mean it's been a long time since i've played it right but it's um it's like pvp it's just oh you have a new season so you start everything all over again the grind or just adding dungeons i guess that get progressively harder or, or that are progressive gear checks to the previous dungeons basically that's something that diablo does and it's it's been very successful for that franchise it does two things number one uh when when we're talking about like what the end game is number mm-hmm. one is procedurally generated content and that is absolutely an end game thing mm-hmm. that is very convenient for developers if you have a game that just creates random assets then people can run through it and and 
it gives the illusion of new content, even though it's not actually new content. It's just a reshuffling of already existing content. And the other one is a seasonal resets. Or like every every three months or so, they just put you back down to zero so that you can go through uh, the actual experience again of going I, from zero to a hundred. Well, it's not that right in, in Diablo. It, it you were from zero to it's not a hundred. What was the? It's level sixty in Diablo yeah, three. Sixty exactly. I mean, you were there pretty quick. Yeah, and, I know. And it it only just, takes like a day or two. <laughs> um, and it's just about. I I actually sort of enjoyed the Diablo three seasons. In, in the sense that they're doing like items with like different bonuses. So now you have like different build metas or whatever. And you'd get to play characters that maybe you wouldn't normally play. So I, I like that. But at the same time, obviously, eventually they just stopped. Because they're not making money off of it anymore. Yeah. So um, yeah, I It enjoyed... used to be that like they had a new hook for every season and whatever. And that just became lazier and lazier for every new season. Yeah, but I, I enjoyed the concept of that while it lasted. And we played a lot of Diablo 3 back in the day. Um, n- not particularly interested in, in playing Diablo 4. Um, but but I did enjoy that concept. But at the same time, especially with, with where video game developing development is heading now, I just don't see that really happening all that much anymore because everyone's just like how can we monetize this how can we make money off of this right and i just don't enjoy having to continually uh, like pay for a game that i've already bought i i refuse to do that man i think the scummiest monetization i've ever seen in any video game was uh artifact uh that was gonna be steam's um hearthstone killer (laughs) <laughs> right, but they're gonna release their own collectible card game, and they hired the guy who created Magic: The Gathering to right. create like a new, a new card game that was gonna be like, we're gonna release it. It was, it was Valve. It was like Valve's first new game in like fifteen years or something. It was Artifact, and it had the monetization. We first had to buy the game itself, and then they set up a a, a, a system where you you literally had to like pay a dollar every time you wanted to play the game. <laughs> somehow it didn't take off it didn't take off who knew but that's not end game that's even start game so that's that's the opposite of what today's topic is yeah but uh a bit of a tangent yeah but 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 going back to the diablo seasonal thing that's something people do as well where it's like and i don't even know if you can call that end game or not but like just going back to the beginning or definitely i think in souls games um it's like near automata plus? huh is New Game Plus Endgame? New Game Plus is an interesting thing because kinda. Because it's harder and it often like it sometimes goes up to like, has It goes up to like plus nine, right? I don't know how far it goes, <laughs> but um by the way, that's why I think Dark Souls 2 is is good. Is that things are different in New Game Plus? Oh yeah. Encounters um, are different. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if it shakes things up, and I, I think that's the same. Doesn't Final Fantasy VII Remake have no game plus? It, it, yes. Um, so, so if things are different, if things get shaken up, added, um, maybe that's end game. If you give me a reason to play the game over again, but in this case, you know, with the gear and skills I already have, and I actually want to do that, then. To me, that's yeah. that's okay. Obviously, like New Game Plus is also like it's it's very, it's an easy way of doing it because you just take the same content, you give it to the player again, except that like now we've made number bigger, so you have to also get gear with number bigger, but. Um, it's not actually like more content. It's just a reason to go through the same content once more. But isn't that just what Steel Pass is in Warframe? Um, yes, yes, and you it like is. That. They add well. I'm not sure I like Steel Path. Um, oh, you just talk about it a lot, I guess. So it's well, and you have to, you have to because it's become the the meta. When when they released Steel Path uh, to the game, they 
<laughs> they said that, that like this is not meant to be end game. This is not something that we're going to be balancing the game around. We're just giving it to certain like high level players so that they have something new to do. But it's not our vision for what Warframe is going to be, right? And and then they completely went back on that. And now the game is one hundred percent balanced around Steel Path and regular star chart stuff is just completely relevant mm. and um, unfortunately it's like i don't think it's been for the good of the game to balance but but that's a, that's a completely different discussion of just like that's more a discussion of power creep and what mm. that does to a game long term so so what should end game content look like in Warframe for you then? Well, that's that's the big argument, right, between the player base. Whereas, mm -hmm. like, should they add more stuff that's a challenge for for high level players? Should they continue expanding on the story and just give something that that everyone can experience and that everyone can play, um, regardless of like what level they're at? But it's more sort of just like lore and narrative and story things. Um, should they add diversity of content rather than difficulty? Should they add like more new game modes and new ways of interacting with the game? Um, all of these are valid arguments for like what what end game is to you and what you would how you would like to interact with the game. Uh, well the newest thing, Duviri, mm -hmm. um, is that they did take the path of procedurally generated content to an extent. Um, of just, you, you enter this thing where you just go through... It, it's, it feels like playing a rift in Diablo, where you're just thrown from thing to thing. So it's not like you enter a defense mission. It's like, okay, first you get to play five rounds of defense and then it switches and now it's five minutes of survival and then it switches and now it's a void flood and then it switches now it's excavation and you just keep on pushing yourself as far as you can uh, in this thing that's constantly changing around which is interesting um hmm. kind of throws you like for a loop and there's some curveballs and it's also got the the thing of like uh randomness to it uh, sort of like uh, the Hearthstone's Battlegrounds, where you start the mission, but you have to pick your Warframe. You get a selection of five different ones, and then you get to pick your weapons. And I, I actually thought about it. I've been watching you play this, and I think it's not Battlegrounds that's the comparison in Hearthstone. It's the dungeon runs. Because you keep yes. getting to pick uh, perks, right? Correct. Between every round, you get yeah. to pick new perks. Yeah. So... You're right. It is like dungeon runs in in Hearthstone, hmm. which which were popular. <laughs> they were very popular, but they were so low content that they that Blizzard couldn't monetize, so they abandoned that and stopped <laughs> stopped creating new stuff for it. Yeah. Um, you know the whole I, I thought about something else actually. The the whole idea of like, oh, what should end game content be? It's like for a lot of my games, that's actually not much of a problem because uh, that's what mods are for. Well, you're always coming back to mods in every... I know. They, they add so much... This is your standing game. thing in every podcast episode. You're just constantly arguing that every game should allow for no, modding. No, I'm not saying... I don't want every... I don't play like things like Dark Souls with mods. Not every game needs mods. But I think mods add a lot of replay value or end game to, to games. Like... A thing that I continually run into with the type of game that I like to play, which is, you know, like uh, like colony sims or, or just, you know, like 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 build build your whatever. Also is massive that... games. You play a lot of that. Like uh Fallout, Skyrim, like games that just have yeah. this this almost unpenetrable amount of content in well, it. Well, they're, they're, the argument doesn't hold quite as much, but because what I try to what I'm trying to say is eventually you just run out of things, right? You've researched your entire research tree and you've done all the things and you're like, now what? That's and always the question. That's The that's answer the... in these games is very easily, oh, mods. Mm. I can just add things. 
to steal because I'm the, the kind of person, right? It's achievement hunter. I don't know if that's the right word. It's not achievement. It's it. I don't need the Steam achievements necessarily, but it's just like I need a goal. Right. I need to work towards something. And it's like, I want to build this. I want to research all of this. And then I have built that and I've researched all of that. And it's like, I know people in Stardew Valley who would just, you know, on the server, they're like, I'm on year seven and doing this and that right now. And I'm just like, once I've done everything and I've reached perfection, which I've done on two characters now, but it's just a thing in the game, which means that, you know, you have to have... Uh, have to be best friends with everyone in the game you have to have built these things that cost an insane amount of money you have to cook every item blah, 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 blah. does star do have an end not, like an actual well, like oh now you get the end credits thing i don't i don't know if there's <laughs> something that triggers that you get like a scene when you get the perfection and you go to the place but i wouldn't call that credits and it was mm -hmm. also only I think in the most recent update. So, wouldn't it be funny if is, it has an end and it's had it all along and you just don't know about it? <laughs> no, I I would know about it at this point, right? Mm. But the thing is, like, once I have that, I just I'm like, well, I've done that now, and I don't really see the point in continuing because there's nothing I can reach more. So you'd have to add like something more for me to try to a new goal, you know? Um, so. So that's what I need for, for Endgame. I need something that I can work towards. Well, I mean, again, cycling back to Warframe, um, a common argument from players is that Warframe doesn't actually have any Endgame and that uh, what constitutes Endgame in Warframe is just finding your own goals, setting setting your own thing to do. I want to collect all the weapons. I want to master every Warframe. I want to this or that. Um, back in the day, they used to have a different system called like Void Towers, which now has been replaced with like, you know, Relic Missions. And, and it used to be, and they had like raids that you had to do together in in groups of people, and and that was sort of like an end gamey thing. It was rem this was before my time, so I never got to experience that. But my impression was that like it was removed from the game because even though it did constitute what people refer to as end game content, it was like it had issues and it wasn't really like I don't know good. <laughs> I think, I mean, the problem. Because raids, that's just from World of Warcraft. Well, you yeah, just rip what, that system of raids and like, oh yeah, this yeah, is endgame. It game. doesn't work because the problem with, War, uh, with Warframe, to me, as someone who hasn't played it in almost a year, uh, over a year now, is um, you play together, you play cooperatively, but, but not really, right? Yeah. It's not co-op. You play alongside each other. I think that's what Warframe is to me. Because like for most of the missions, it really doesn't matter if you're team working and you're not really harmonizing your skills with the rest of the team. There's no need to go on, on Discord together and actually say like, okay, you take this one, I take this one, I crowd control this or whatever, right? They tried it's... to revive that with Railjack, but then people complained and then they streamlined it so that everyone is a DPS it's... again. Yeah, exactly. It is a game where where you just where you're just the main character alongside three other people who, who are also the main character and you're just all doing the same thing alongside each other, but they tried to do it again with an event called Operation Scarlet Spear, which I, f I loved it. S some people loved it, some people hated it. But they div and it didn't work the way they wanted to, and it happened like right at the beginning of the pandemic. So it was like chaos with like, um, just you know, bugs and system issues while everyone had just started like working from home. Um, so it was it was like a, an administrative nightmare to get the event to work. But that was an event where people were divided up in teams that had to coordinate. So you had one team doing stuff down on Earth. And then you had another team doing stuff up in space doing Railjack. And then you had to coordinate that so the oh now the Earth people have to do something and, and to, to let the people up in space progress. 
And then, oh, now the people up in space have to do something to let the people down on Earth progress. So you actually do have to, like, it feels like you're team working, right? Even, even though the event didn't really go flawless or stuff, but it was one of the few times in Warframe's history where it really, really felt like you, you were team working and teamwork was a necessity to actually progress. That was cool. Yeah. But I think, you know, what you were seeing, right, the whole, like, every every Warframe is a DUPS is kind of at the root of a lot of maybe Warframe's lack of cooperative in the game. Because it's it, it's not just cooperative. It, it's also the reason why you can't have PvP, right? There is, <laughs> there is PvP. Yes, <laughs> but it's dead. Yes, no one plays Warframe's PvP. You, yeah. Um, it's just, and I mean, there's there's too many Warframes, right? It's like it it's almost impossible. Like for for proper PvP, you'd have to be like, ah, you you have to have strategies for how to deal with this, and they'd have to be like markedly different, I guess. And uh, while some Warframes play very very differently, like Limbo, for example, yeah, I'd argue that most of them sort of still are too similar to each other in that sense. I think they were a bit more diverse before. I think now you're sort of hamstrung with like the the whole idea of I don't know what how it plays how the game plays so what what expectations there are that Warframe has to be able to do this like you have to have one ability that helps with like mobility you have to have one ability that gives you 90% damage reduction you have to have one ability that gives armor stripping to enemies a new thing nowadays is you have to have an ability for energy generation. And you have to have an ability for AoE damage. But that's have... already five. <laughs> well, that's why you combine them. Okay. So you can have one th- one ability that does many things. But, but um, it's like, so all of the new Warframes sort of like have a mishmash of that, which still makes them feel samey. They, they recently reworked Grendel, and I kind of preferred Grendel the way he was before, because now he just... He's better now, and he's stronger in many ways, but now he just feels like every other Warframe. He doesn't feel unique anymore. Uh, but I think they've just maneuvered themselves into the position where they they can't get that sort of content anymore. So, it's so kind of Warframe, like... I think, but by the way that they've designed the game so far, I think, is destined to struggle to figure out endgame content in a way that we've been discussing. Can I say that Warframe design has taken the same trajectory as New Metal? <laughs> Think about it. It stopped being relevant in the hey, late nineties. No, it's relevant again. It's uh, popular again. Okay, okay it's okay. a cycle. But uh, <laughs> but no, it New Metal started out as like hybrid metal. That was like the idea behind it when it came out. So you had like Static X, they were doing trans metal. You had Limp Bizkit, they were doing like rap metal. You had. Um, early incubus which was like funk metal you had snot which was punk metal and like everyone did their incubus is metal well, i don't know it was well it, 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 this is to my point right have you listened to early incubus like really really early incubus i have listened to incubus but i have no idea when in their career the stuff that i've listened to was made so i don't know Oh, if we're talking about, like, Make Yourself, then we're not talking about Early Incubus. Um, but anyway, mm-hmm. they um, th- this was, like, a very experimental phase of, of music, and, and there was a, a very fascinating genre, and it was fun to be a new metal listener because you, everyone came up with something new and and different, and there were so many different sounds that, that still sort of, like, all fit into this one big umbrella. And then over time, that sort of got streamlined and the sound became homogenized. Uh, The the biggest one was like Linkin Park. When Linkin Park came out in like, what was it, 2000 or 2001? I don't know when Hybrid Theory came out. I don't know. Um, And Hybrid Theory was, at the time, the best-selling debut album of any band ever in the history of music. And... um, that's what made new metal like this big mainstream almost pop phenomenon it's like mtv whatever and 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 it set the tone and from now on all of the innovation was gone all of the experimentation was gone now everyone is trying to sound like linkin park and it it became new metal as a genre 
uh, suddenly everything started sounding the same. Mm. There were also some inspirations from like corn and Deftones. So people threw in some corn and they threw in some Deftones and they threw in some Linkin Park and then they mished those, match, mishmashed those three together and like there. Now every single new metal band that exists just sound like some amalgamation of corn, Deftones and Linkin Park and just veer slightly in one direction more than the other. But that's basically it. And the entire genre just became super boring. And that's kind of <laughs> that's kind of what Warframe design has become. Whereas, like, it used to be more, it went in every different direction, and you had here's how Ember works, here's how Ember plays, here's how Trinity plays, completely different. Here's how Excalibur plays, completely different. Whereas now that has been streamlined into one ability for 90% damage reduction, one ability for AoE, one ability for energy generation, one ability for blah, blah, blah. And, and, and all of the Warframes have that. So we've Linkin Parkified uh, the Warframe design. Oh, dear. <laughs> Just quickly, because I had to look this up. Mm -hmm. So Wikipedia says the genres for, for Incubus are alternative rock, alternative metal, funk metal, and new metal. And it would appear... Metal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. <laughs> I just wanted to say, so So um, the record of theirs that I have was Morning View. Yeah, well, and oh, well that, that, then you're way too late. They, exactly. Then you, then you haven't heard what they sounded like when they were funk metal. Exactly, because it says... Um, Continuing the move away from new metal, the yep. album ranges widely from soft to hard rock uh, sounds in the style of alternative rock, because that's what I would yeah. call them, right? Yeah. Alt rock. So, but, so, but that's because, and that was a conscious yeah. choice on their part, because they were also on that journey of Linkin Parkify themselves. Um, <laughs> is if you listen to like uh, Fungus Among Us mm. or like even even like Science parts of that album, um, if you listen to that you wouldn't even know it's the same band. Okay. Well, I, you know, at the time, it's not like you had Spotify or something where you could just yeah. listen to everything from a band. You had like that one CD from a band or something, right? So I had I had Morning View and that came out when I was 15. So maybe I was just too young for, for, for all of that. Probably. Like before. And th th what's sad is like Morning View is I think the first time they took like a step in, in a direction that I was less in, into. Um, I liked it. It was my direction, right? I'm the alt rock girl. Yeah, but but the album before that, Make Yourself. I, I'm going to say that like us old school new metal people, we're, we're all going to say that Make Yourself was peak Incubus. That was That was their best album and they still had some of their old stuff in there, but they were veering into the more melodic sort of alt-rock thing um, in that album. That was like the first... That was when they were moving towards something that was more palatable for like everyone, I guess. But they they still had their originality, I, I, I actually wouldn't call what what Incubus did palatable for everyone because I think they, they worked a lot with like dissonant and weird sounds still. It's just in an alt rock style. So melodic is an interesting choice of words. Um, in that way, it was just a different subset of impalatable because if we're talking about everyone, especially if we're talking about what people were listening to mainstream wise when we were kids, it was neither alt rock nor was it new metal. I'm going to say, well, I'm I'm a couple years older than you are, but I'm going to say that, like, um, wasn't, the, like, your teenage years, wasn't that sort of, like, when the whole emo wave came? Like, My Chemical Romance was huge. I think, I mean, emo was, start, I was slightly too old for it already. Then. Oh, really? I think so. Like, I remember, I listened to some dashboard confessional when nice. I was, like, when I was, like, <laughs> 18 or 19 oh man I, that's so what confessional that, or a fucking whiner i have like one or two songs that actually did go on repeat but for, for like 90 yeah. percent of dashboard confessional was like wow that's, fucking whiner that's why i said some because most of it i was already like this is too whiny for me so i think i was slightly too old for emo already and i never listened to my chemical romance so so um i think no, for my team, I mean, it's so hard to say what was even popular because it's like, what what were your friends listening to? What was cool at the time? So so we had a huge Nirvana craze. And I mean, <laughs> Kurt Cobain had been dead for like seven oh, yeah. years at that Yeah, point. I knew a guy who was like super, super into grunge, who was also like, so yeah. So, so, but 
But, Kurt uh, had been dead. <laughs> exactly. So, um, so it's it's so it was different because it's like you had what was on MTV, and I was never interested in the kind of music that was playing on MTV. So, so that's what I judge is what's the popular stuff at the time, right? It's yeah. what what was MTV playing, and that was did, did, nice, with the exception of Linkin Park. Of did course. you know that like back in the day, there were like they had several channels. There was MTV, and then there was MTV Two. I know, and that's where they played the alternative stuff, and especially MTV Two, like after midnight. That's when you could find like the the new metal <laughs> music videos because. The- Man, people were still making music videos back the, then. The only new metal that I ever heard on MTV, but that was played like up and down was Limp Bizkit and uh, Linkin Park, obviously. And yeah. I was never that fond of Linkin Park or Limp Bizkit, obviously. But I, I wasn't. A Limp Bizkit is interesting because metal. it hasn't aged well. Because like it was, it, it, I there's still new metal that that's good, and I can go back and listen to it. I still go back and listen to Static X. Static X is is fucking rad. But uh, but I I can't like I loved Limp Bizkit back in the day, but I cannot go back and listen to it now. It has just aged so horribly. No. Corn has also not aged well. So um, may- maybe that's just where I grew up locally, but for a lot of my, my peers age-wise, I did not have overlap musical taste-wise. I had some, and I mean, that's the people I hung out with, right, that were going in like similar directions as me, and we exchanged our music, but it was just so much harder to just discover new things, right? You were kind of limited to to what people around you were listening to. Sorta. I mean, there were internet resources. There, there was a there was a but website. You had to know what to look for. I know there was a website back then called Shoutweb. Shoutweb was like the hub for like new new metal and like new releases. So everyone, I don't maybe not everyone, but a lot of people who were like into new metal, they were like slavishly following Shoutweb to see like what's upcoming and whatever. Um, other than that, I just hung out with a bunch of alternative kids from a bunch of different um, walks of life. So I had my grunge friend. I had my punk friend. Mm-hmm. I had my emo friend. I had my singer-songwriter folk friend. Mm-hmm. And it's like, we, we, we tried to share and exchange things, but mostly there was like, we were not really super compatible. But it still it still allowed me to at least be knowledgeable about other scenes, even though I didn't listen to them myself. I wanted to get to that, right? We we come from that age where you would make, not mixtapes, we were in the age where mix you tapes. could burn CDs for your friends, right? You I actually you did picked... do a couple of mixtapes with, with one of my friends. Uh, I did I w- CDs. Well, I mean, we moved over to CDs after a while, but we, I, I was right at the cusp of it, like right when we yeah. switched from mixtapes to CDs. And... Um, so I, I mean, I still have a lot of my, just like you put your favorites on there and then you just pass them around and you try to discover new things. And if you find one where you're like, hey, this slams, then you look up the artist and you go and to, you know, whatever you were using, like Emu, E-Donkey, um, um, what was the first ones? Um, what, Napster, Napster? Yeah. and all of that. And you and try Kazaa. to find more. Audio and, Galaxy was a big one for me. That one was a good place to find so, obscure things. So that's what you did, right? But what, what was I listening to at the time? It's like alternative rock things, grunge. Um, and I... Were you a Smashing my, Pumpkins girl? I Yeah, I did have some mm. Smashing Pumpkins, yes. Um... Scott Punk. <laughs> I really Sc- like Scott Oh my Ska god. Punk. <laughs> I don't know. I've tried. I have tried to get into ska and it's I just no Scott Punk, not Scott. Scott Punk. So I just like the <laughs> punk with the trumpets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um I had um like Irish uh, Irish music, Irish folk music. Dropkick Murphys. No, that oh. those are fake Irish. <laughs> Ooh, I think they're there American, you go. right? Yes, there we go. Um, on, but some it. of that too. Make short. some enemies. No, I actually mean like you know <laughs> Irish folk music, like the people that play and like you know like Sean Kane and um, Mumford uh, Mary and Black. Sons. No, that's that's not. No, that's not the same thing at all. That it's the same thing. No, no. I'm I'm talking about like the sometimes it's just like um instrumental music uh of people that play like accordion <laughs> like I'm talking 
actual traditional no. Irish music. It has nothing to do with Mumford and Sons. And those are English, I think. <laughs> um and it's just something I shared with my mom, right? So 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 that was that. Uh I listened to a lot of French chansons with my mom, not necessarily because I was a big fan of it, but because she liked it and it was just some something to share, right? But it's just like weird, weird mix of things. Um We have gotten very far. No, I'll keep going. This is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> from from the topic but okay no but it's uh, yeah very rare that the stuff that i would listen to would actually be on the on the radio i suppose but then you just you make these you make these these mix cds and you pass them along so you See, discover I... something and it's like then you get like tool and you don't even know what genre that is i still don't know what genre tool is do no you, and, and, do you know what genre they are i don't and the tool was interesting because tool tool had a lot of overlap like it, it no matter what sort of alternative scene you were in you could still listen to tool yeah. so new metal people listened to tool uh, as well they were also featured on shout web it's funny this was back in the, do you remember stained it rings a bell, but I can't remember a song. Um, stained. Well, it's it's not exactly like to the level of I don't know Creed and uh, I do remember Creed <laughs> and uh, oh, Chad Kroger. What's the name of the band? I'm uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, with uh -huh. arms wide open. Yeah, uh, oh, look at look at this photograph. Yeah, <laughs> oh, what's like, the name? Oh, oh my god, god. He's married to Avril Lavigne. I can't Nickelback. Remember. Nickelback. Thank you. So Wait, he was married to Avril Lavigne. Isn't he still? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> anyway, now I have to look that up. Keep sure. talking. But um, uh, stained nowadays is more in 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 sort of that genre. I'm gonna say of like there, it's associated more with like Nickelback and and Creed, like musically. But back in the day, that it was actually sort of like hyped and in 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 new metal things. So it was like the two most anticipated albums of that year was like stained like you know we're talking like shout web and like new metal circles it was like stains break the cycle and the tools lateralis and one these two <laughs> are not like each one of these is not like the others yeah and and if you look if you look back on it and like which of these two albums have stood the test of time who are we still talking about are we still talking about tool yes are we still talking about stained no, no. we are not but and isn't isn't it funny i guess that no matter what alternative music scene you were into you were listening to lateralis yeah, pretty much <laughs> i looked it up by the way chad kroger and ever Levine were married in 2013 and divorced in 2015 so oh okay it's only 2 years but i was right yes it did happen Let's be, uh, don't be sad that it's over. <laughs> <laughs> Just be, be glad that it happened. Oh, good lord, Nickelback. <laughs> and, and it's like Creed was basically the same band. Yeah, I mean, but except Creed still had the thing and there was Christian rock as well. Um, oh. Yeah, it was Christian oh. rock. Uh, okay. But otherwise it's like Nickelback, Creed, Fuel. <laughs> they were all in the same... Uh, this is this is like no one wants them. That's the thing. It's like you can't put them in the new metal thing because new metal fans are like, no, we don't want them. They're not. <laughs> no, yeah, no, nobody wants them. You know, nobody you wants know, to be associated. You with know them. who else was around in my my child and teen teenage years that I have some fun memories of? No, the Bloodhound Gang. Oh, that was a thing. Um, they also sort of defy genres, but yeah, that's that's sort of how I got there. The they're in the genre of we 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 pretend like we're an alternative thing, but we're still an MTV band. Yeah, and I mean, the thing is, they made for those you know we kind of like talking. the Offspring, right? The Offspring is also <sighs> we pretend to be alternative, but we're on MTV. But they're a bit more palatable than the Bloodhound Gang. Well, yeah, from Americana and forward, we like you know, pretty fly for a white guy. That's when they really started going hard on getting a mainstream sound. No, I, it's not the sound I'm talking about. It's the lyrics <laughs> because that's where I'm trying to get right. The Bloodhound Gang for those you know, we keep talking like people 
listening to this i mean i guess <laughs> they are our age i think and i, I know yeah, what we're talking our, about our but, audience is a bit older than uh, some, just, some other youtube just channels in case yeah. there is someone here listening who's a bit younger and has never heard of the bloodhound gang because i don't oh think God, that but... anyone talks about them still as they made um songs with very explicit lyrics i guess is the point and i have a memory that um because because you have to remember i grew up in austria and uh, english skills especially among let's say the who were the adults at the time i was young and oh up, you had a thing where great. people were singing the lyrics but they didn't know what they meant or what well number one that and number two is there wasn't ever any censorship of it on the radio because no one <laughs> knew what they were saying anyway right so and i guess in the u.s a lot of that was censored or it just wasn't played on the radio and hey, i have remember? a memory now now everything's on the internet right but back then where everything was on tv remember where people bands made two versions of songs they made the explicit version that was on the cd yeah. and then they made a a, a uh, radio friendly version where they ex exchanged certain words yes but you most didn't... notably black eyed peas let's get it started that is not what they're singing on the album well the thing is you didn't have censored versions on the radio in Austria, because, like, why would you? <laughs> no one knows what they're saying. <laughs> no, censorship but, is an American thing in the land of freedom of speech. Uh, That's where we censor. I guess the next thing is also, hey even 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 if people knew what they were saying, I don't think anyone would have cared, right? Because swearing isn't really all that taboo in Austria. But what I'm trying to get at is <clears throat> my brother's school had this thing where they had, like, some kids from a school in Iowa, I think. It was a four-letter state. I think it was Iowa. <laughs> um, Either Iowa it could or have, Utah. No, no, Ohio. It could have been Ohio as well. I had a keychain with it on it. I just remember it was four letters. So Iowa or Ohio. Either way, I think both are Midwest. Um, it's funny, like when you say four-letter state, no matter which one you pick, it's going to be some sort of like backwater shithole. <laughs> yeah. So... <laughs> um they they were it was sort of an exchange thing or an exchange would have implied it going both ways they were staying at my brother's school for some reason for like a week or so and they asked like you know families like oh do you want to take a student or a teacher or something and my mom was like oh yeah sure so we had a student and a teacher staying with us actually for a week i think so my mom was driving us somewhere and we had the student and the teacher in the car and the Bloodhound ca gang came on the radio. <gasps> and, and they were like, oh my, my mom god, was just you're like allowed happily, to listen well, to this? Or no, what? it's just like, my mom was happily singing along, number one. <laughs> number two, the teacher was completely shocked. Because, <gasps> of course, it was, you know, the four-letter states, the, the they're, they're not exactly the most, <clears throat> the, the least uptight, let's put it like that, mm -hmm. right? So... Um, the teacher was like, oh my god, oh my god, turn that off. And the kid was just like, oh, it was like speaking, Christmas. Speaking of four-letter state, was it potentially the song Foxtrot Unicorn, f no, Unicorn it was Charlie Touch. Kilo? It was the Wild Touch. Oh, okay. It was, it was, but the, was the Bad Touch, the Bad Touch. The Bad Touch. The, but, the one but, that had the cover of the single with the two zebras that were fucking. Nice. It was, it was all about Fox fornication. Foxtrot Unifor Uniform, <laughs> Foxtrot Unicorn, Charlie Kilo, that was their way of getting away with saying fuck on the radio. Because yeah. that's, ah, ah yeah, that's I what that it, is. I get it. No, it was, the, it was, it was, it was the Bad Touch, which is all about how the singer wants to fuck the person they're singing to i guess nice um and and that kid had just like eyes like saucers and just like oh i can't believe i'm listening to this <laughs> and then you're like turn it off turn it off what are you doing and i'm just sitting there laughing my ass off think of the children <laughs> it's like, you guys are so uptight <laughs> quick co uh, covered Cover, cover that bare ass with blood so that we can show it <laughs> to kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, quick, quick, shoot the kid so it doesn't hear the bad word. <laughs> uh, That's yeah. funny. I just thought it was such a fun memory, especially because it had my mom happily singing along to the bad touch. Did she know the lyrics or did she, did she understand what she was saying? Well, the thing is, like, you know,
know, my parents lived in the U.S. for two years. So yeah, but I know that your mom's English got progressively worse the yeah, older she got. Yeah, but it was got. still pretty good at the time. So I, I think she knew. Just I, The thing is, I think she technically would have understood the lyrics. I, she just didn't think about it all that much. Do you sometimes do that when you listen to the song and you understand the words individually, but you don't care enough to actually listen to the content of it and put it together? Sort of. And when you stop to think about it, you realize how fucked up like some lyrics yeah. are. It's like, you know, everyone that happily sings along to Pumped Up Kicks and then it's like, oh. Yeah. Oh, oh wow, yeah. You know? um, Good so, example. So kind of that. <laughs> where it's like, she, she sort of understood, but she just never stopped to think about it. Um, yeah. Can we find our way back to endgame content or do we just <laughs> wanna say that this was that the endgame content of our podcast how was actually musical discussion? There you go. Uh how do we how do we, how do we get there? How what, did we get here? It was because you said that Warframe development was oh, yeah. taking the new metal. They trajectory. knew they knew meta they knew metalified <laughs> uh Warframe design. Mm. There we go. That was how we got there. Well, I I don't think we can find our way back. We can, all right. But I can, I can throw I can throw this out, right? There are certain games that um, you go back to, and you like year after year after year, and you keep on playing it. Uh, either are the... you just talking about me specifically? Because you know I do that, or just no people do that. Mm. I think everyone does that. Okay, you have games that you just. <clears throat> You just you just come back to them over and over again, mm -hmm. and it's not always like just live service games or MMOs or things that have like infinite content. You you have other games that you just like. Hey, I I feel like playing this game again. Yeah, I do that all the time. Yeah. So, in 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 a way, it's like a, I'm not sure you can designate that as end game or not, but but you can probably sort of crystallize why you keep coming back to that game. Um, Subnautica, that's a game you've played many many times, right? Uh, I suppose I just enjoy the underwater atmosphere. It is like if if the actual you know, world or scenario or feel or gameplay loop is enjoyable enough to where you just want to keep coming back to it, regardless of the fact that they're not adding more stuff to it. You just want to keep coming back to it. Is that end game? Is right? starting again end game? That kind of goes back to the whole new game plus, I suppose. I suppose. Uh, there's also games that like just you know they're, you're you're meant to play it over and over again. Like Civ. Civ, to an extent, collectible card games as well. Hearthstone. Age of Empires. Uh, where they don't like the, it's not. Maybe that's a thing where you just, you build a game where it doesn't make sense to even talk about end game as a constant concept because you're just meant to play it as a loop. You just play it over and over and over again, and that's how you play the game. Right? Yeah, like, so, like all of these, what are they? Counter Strike. Is that still relevant today? Maybe not. It's no, like it's Call it's, of Duty. Well, and, and fighting games, but that's competitive games. That's that's another thing. I think what it, what it boils down to is that the, the odious discussion of end game as a concept and demands from the player base that end game has to exist it's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy because it's only a certain kind of games where that um where that becomes a necessity to have that discussion and that is when you create a game that has a narrative and a story but it's also a game that goes on forever Oh, like MMOs, basically. Like MMOs, like Diablo, like live service games like Warframe, where where you're basically setting yourself up for... A, a, you're creating a platform where people want two things. They want the narrative, and then they also want the endless experience of a Civ. <laughs> And uh, and you and now suddenly you have to satisfy both of them at the same time. 
Yeah. Maybe you just shouldn't, right? Just pick one. <laughs> hmm. I mean, there's... <sighs> I honestly think, and this is stupid and naive, but I think video games would so much would be so much better if there weren't any money involved, <laughs> <laughs> and you just made design decisions based on what would be a good experience, right? Are you? D did you know that in Sweden, and this was this was absolutely a socialist thing back in like the sixties and seventies, there was a an idea that we were going to free art from the money the idea was that <clears throat> art and commercial in true art true art and commercial interests are diametrically opposed to each other if you're chasing the money then you're not creating true art you are creating things that you think are going to sell right mm -hmm. so the idea was in order to create true art in this country in order to free art from monetary interests uh, what we did was we created something called an artist's salary and we designated important artists who were going to receive this and the idea was these people are going to receive a salary for life with no expectation of anything like in return just so that like now you can create art you don't have to worry about money you don't have to worry about living the government is going to pay you for life just to be an artist and if you create art that's great if you don't create art that's also great uh just because there is no expectation. You don't have to feel pressured to do anything. Um, and now we know that whatever art you do create is going to be true art because it's going to come from the soul and it's not going to come from a place of needing it to be commercially viable. So it's going to be as arty art, true art as art can be. <laughs> My God, they took the desperation out of art. They took the desperation out of art. And one could argue that the struggling artist is like a part of it, right? Where it's like, if, you, if you're not struggling, then how, how do you even know what true art is, right? Because art is born out of adversity. But what if you take out the adversity? Oh my God, that's a that's a that's a good um, that's a good angle on it. That like they actually created a system where true art cannot exist because mm. art is born out of adversity. <laughs> no, but oh. so we still have obviously later generations of politicians was like this is fucking nonsense. Uh, so they abolished that system. But the people who were designated to have this artist pay uh, for life, they get to keep it. Mm. So we still have like a hundred people or so in Sweden who are going to get paid. They, they have a salary for life. Yeah, I think one of your friends has people like that for neighbors, right? Some sort of... M maybe. And and I know there's like, there's one clown. <laughs> there's one clown who has it. Uh, there's one chess player who has it. Chess isn't art. I know, right? It's weird. But mostly it's like, it's sculptors, movie directors, painters, artists. Hmm. But it is funny that there's one clown and one chess player who who have it. <laughs> so I'm guessing it was um shit. What's his name? Um, Seven Seals. Oh, Ingmar Bergman. Yeah. No, 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 no. He he didn't need that. He was like way way too successful to to. Okay, so they give it to unsuccessful artists. Actually, uh. Like, there was a caveat where it's like, you only get it so long as you don't make too much money. If you make too much money off of your projects, then you, uh, like, for that year, you don't get any artist okay, salary or whatever. Because I was like, imagine being Ingmar Bergman and just was like, I got this for my achievement and then you get this for being a clown. <laughs> well, it was a very famous clown. Uh, I... But we do, we do have a famous uh, movie director... Uh, Roy Andersson. Roy Andersson is a famous Swedish uh, movie director uh, who does have it. Mm. Never heard of him, to be honest. Well, he has he has made he has made movies that people have heard about. And and this is how is that Endgame content? 
Is that the end game for art? No, probably. Uh, <laughs> that is absolutely the end game for art. Uh, but um, no, you were talking about how uh, video game development would probably oh, be right, better right, if, right. if yeah, money wasn't involved. You're and... correct. Well, yes. I I maintain this, but I also know that's obviously never going to happen. I just think a lot of a lot of. Are you flaws. saying that like small indie developers is that where you find the art in video games? No, they don't. Uh, my problem is that they don't have the resources to pull off what I want in a video game. I want the resources of a triple A studio, <laughs> okay, and the vision of an indie game designer. Ooh, you know. And that's never going to happen. So. Well, I mean, that's typically what happens f for like the first big project the studio does. And then they, they uh, lose their soul somewhere along the way. Yeah, but they don't have the resources yet. So it's like, it's very rare that, it was like Hollow Knight maybe is an example where that did happen. Where they they got the resources and yeah, then Yeah, a, a Kickstarter campaign. Yeah, but it is it is quite rare for, for that to happen. But I'm just like, this is me dreaming. I know it's not realistic. Like I said, I work in development. I understand business cases and all of that. But um, this, it would be nice if you could occasionally get that. Like, you know, a Bethesda game where they just got to... Timelines and money aren't involved. Timelines is the next thing where it's like... I mean, I, I, could, I could go on an entire one-hour rant about what I think about video game developers showing concept art for games. Like, you, you should never discuss a project while it's still in concept. Like, Jesus. Anyway. <clears throat> hey. If, if, if they just got all the time they needed to make the actual product and the, the money and the resources they needed uh, with no expectation of actually making endless amounts of money off of it, that would be great games. But... That's not that's not gonna happen. Well, you so you, you say that you have an entire hour to discuss artistic integrity in video games. I don't. I have an entire <laughs> hour of discussing what I think about how they handle their projects. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anyone wants to hear me rant about project management in video game design for an hour, to be quite honest. <laughs> we'll see but but we can discuss artistic integrity yes but but maybe not technical aspects of uh right right but that could be moment. hey hey maybe that could be next week <laughs> maybe that could be next week maybe you'll find out <laughs> that's the end people that's the end of the episode you'll find out next week come back next week and 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 see what we got cooking <laughs>